There's a little known part of Hollywood that most people are not aware of, known as the audience test preview. The recently released book, Audienceology, reveals this for the first time. Our podcast series, Don't Kill the Messenger, brings this book to life, taking a peek behind the curtain. And now, join author and entertainment research expert, Kevin Getz. So many of you don't know that before I had this podcast, before I embarked on the career that I'm currently in, I was an actor, a singer, and a dancer. Made my living that way for years. And as a dancer, I studied uh, principally ballet and had a great appreciation and still do for really extraordinary choreography. Well, now cut to several years later, I'm testing a movie called Atomic Blonde starring Charlize Theron. There's a sequence where Charlize and the bad guy are going toe to toe in a fight sequence that I was blown away by. And many of you probably were, too, if you saw it. And it was like five minutes of screen time, what seemed like five minutes of a single camera shot, which means the actors were really going at it. I left thinking, who the heck did this? And I found out that the stunt coordinator was, in fact, the director, David Leach. And I remember thinking he has got to be a ballet dancer because it was so beautiful and balletic and just flowed like I'd never seen anything like it before. He not only directed that, he also went on to direct Deadpool 2 and Hobbs and Shaw and this last summer's Bullet Train, which is on its way to crossing the $100 million mark at the box office. Incidentally, David's cumulative box office total exceeds $2 billion. He produces with his equally talented and brilliant wife, Kelly McCormick. Kelly began her career working at, uh, among other places, Sierra Affinity, where she led and produced movies like Manchester by the Sea and Whiplash and Hell or High Water, to name just a few, before joining with David to produce all those movies that I just mentioned. I'm thrilled to call them my friends, at least I think we're friends, Uh, and please help me welcome David Leach and Kelly McCormick. Oh, we're excited to be here, Kevin. This and is- we are friends, so that's good. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So I want to start with a very quick story. Let's go back to Stockholm, Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> and the Royal Palace. My husband and I took a trip there. So I'm on a private tour. Neil wanted to stay back at the hotel. I think it was the Grand Hotel. And all of a sudden I hear, Kevin! And it's <laughs> Kelly and David across the courtyard of the Royal Palace. I'm like, what the F are you guys doing here? And then they tell me what? they, Oh, well, we saw you at breakfast this morning at the Grand Hotel. And I'm like, and you didn't say anything at breakfast? Well, you know, you know, you were enjoying your breakfast or something like that. And I was like, you got to be kidding. You were actually mixing, I believe, Atomic Blonde there. And so... You guys were doing the same tour the day I was doing it, and it was just so funny. And um, so let's go back to that. I remember so clearly being in that first screening and watching what I thought was maybe the best action choreography that I had ever seen. And I remember, do you remember what I said to you, David, afterwards? I, I mean, it was something about dance. Oh, yes, should... it was. I said, you are a ballet dancer. You're a choreographer. And Charlize was a, a prima ballerina. And I the way that you choreographed those shots and the length of them, they were artistic masterpieces. I have to tell you, if you haven't seen that and observed that, you must see it. And it was just magical. And you are so gifted. And Kelly, afterwards, I went to you and I said, this is extraordinary. And your husband is a genius. And then I said, do you remember what I said to you afterwards? I don't think I do. What I'll tell you. you. I said, and he's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> I said, he is a stud. And from that, I think we became instant friends. What, what did you learn from that experience of the test screening process? David, did you remember anything specific about that and uh, making any changes based on audience feedback? Yeah. You know, well, the thing you get from the audience is that they don't lie. <laughs> you know, you can, their reactions are genuine. 
And you, when you're sitting in that room with them, it, you can you can sense this sort of um, what's working and what's not. I mean, I embrace the testing process, I think, especially after Atomic. I mean, because we did make, um, you know, certain changes in clarity and them understanding the story. We went back to refine the mystery to make sure that everything paid off um, in a very clear way. So a movie like that, that is sort of this uh, a noir with these twists and turns, you've got to make sure that you're, you're really guiding the audience. And this sort of process allows you to, know if they're do, getting it do you remember a point of clarity that you uh that you particularly changed because the audience said what you thought you were communicating may not have actually been what was communicated um i i'm not i, I think sure there was a third but go ahead yeah there was i mean that had a, some twists obviously and that actually was really interesting writing process too because charlize and um Jez Butterworth actually came in and, and rewrote the script like really late in the process where we were already in prep. And so, and it was beautiful. What the, the work that was done was beautiful, but it also sort of wasn't like, it was such a detailed sort of like noir and twist that there were a couple of pieces that got a little wonky. And, and um, you know, we worked really hard on those during production to make sure that they were clear and clean. And then by the end, there was one specific, like the the connection between her and John Goodman in the end was how where to tuck it in and how. And I think that's one of the things that we really learned from the test screening was, you know, did we give them enough clues that they could buy into that twist working or was it just kind of like, did it feel yeah. tacked on? And we we learned a lot and, and actually changed the movie then, then to make sure that it felt like if, you know, especially upon rewatch that you would really understand that how that was woven together. David, did you want to add something? No, I was thinking there were so many twists and turns that we, and Kelly just sort of capped it, that we worked on during production. And there were a couple that we refined during this process. But what I like about this is it's really, this process is, it's another reason why I love Post so much. You watch the movie get better and better and better and it transforms. And I think some young directors are so um, nervous of this process. And they're just like, if they think it's a judgment or an indictment, and it's not, it is a validation. It's a validation at times. It's an enlightenment at times. It allows you the, a tool to make your storytelling better. And um, I just embrace it. Well, Sherry, Sherry Lansing always says that, and I concur completely, obviously, because it's what I do. But to me, it actualizes the filmmaker's vision even more so, because what you're doing is you are it's the art form of, of 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 our of our craft right which is you're making something for as many people to enjoy it as possible and that may be clarity it may be satisfaction emotional and intellectual satisfaction it may be something right that is going to really engage as many people as we can and that's what our goal is it's not to torture people or take away the artistic integrity of what you're setting out to do in any way yeah I guess if you want to make films that don't reach people, then don't go through this process. I completely agree. I always say if you're an artist, you know, you don't like your painting, put it in the back of your closet. If you're a, uh, you know, a writer, you have a novel. If you don't like it, put it in the back of your drawer. But if you're making movies, you know, there's a business component to it. And you've always, both of you have always embraced that. I imagine when you go home at night after a screening, uh, not to get too personal, but I imagine you lying in bed and Kelly has her producerial hat on and David, you have your directorial hat on. And do you, oh do you, do you, do you have a rule, leave it away from the bedroom or do you start debating? <laughs> Maybe from the bedroom, but from the car ride home and then, in the kitchen and, and then all the way until like the bedroom. But I, it's, Yeah. It can be very hard as an artist, you know, because you're like, you have these little things, little babies in the movie and you don't want to let bet. them go. And uh, Do you guys ever fight? We dis- we argue, disagree, but as a, not fight fight, but it's like more of a, um, we, can, <laughs> we can definitely disagree from those two perspectives of our job. And how do you work out the resolution, Kel? Well, I mean... He wins. <laughs> I don't know if I win. <laughs> Here, let's go a- I don't believe that, Kelly McCormick. I'm not sure I win. I think it's we we 
where we have respect for each other and we listen and we take things in. And even if it gets a little bit where we're, we, we disagree, we can try to find a, you know, find what's right for the movie ultimately and try to let ego go and, and don't let it get into our relationship. But Well, I think that's one of the reasons it actually works for us maybe is the movie is what's best for the movie is sort of most more important to us than our opinions about the movie, if that makes sense. Like, uh, however, an opinion about what's best for the movie. It's still subjective, you know, art is subjective. It is, it is, but it isn't on some level too, like thanks to the audience, you know, and, and thanks to the testing. So it's like, you know, if it's, you know, something that like, David's fallen in love with and it's been in the movie since the director's cut and I've been wanting to get rid of or or quite honestly the studio has been wanting to and I think it's a good note like you know that moment in testing is kind of like really the the ball don't lie it's like the black and white of like you know the truth and the you know the, the truth comes to light and and David's really open to listening to that and that's the only stuff that I'll that I'll really like maybe win or pick on. Well, also Lauren Schuler Donner worked a lot with, you know, Dick Donner, but they also didn't work together a lot because the thought was her job is to always protect the director as the producer. She always felt that was a kind of a, a, a job of a producer to do is to, to, to hold that director's vision, et cetera. But they, um, they, they went on their own a bunch, you know, you guys have, are, basically doing your stuff all together. So it's it's really cool. You must really have that mutual respect for each other. We do, we do. I mean, and just to clear it up, I mean, Kelly does produce stuff for 87 North, our company, on her own that I don't touch. Like Kate, the movie Kate, Netflix, with uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, they did really well for them. Did you do Palm? I did do Palms. Palms. That was fun. Now, But David, you weren't involved in that just as a company, right? Right, that was Kelly. That was actually a Sierra holdover. It was. It was not really eighty seven North. Either. Oh, it wasn't. Okay, but I. But, but it was a beloved project of mine. Yeah. But but to our relationship, like you you spoke about, you know, Laura and Dick. I think, and that's that. Some producers take on that role of like, I'm just going to protect the director at all costs, and whether they did that or not, I'm not sure. But what I think Kelly does is like protect me the protection she has for me is even for myself. And as a filmmaker, you want someone that can tell you the hard truth about what they're feeling artistically and you respect them as an artist as well. So they can call you out and go, that's fucking bullshit. I don't, I don't agree with that. That's that's not funny. That story doesn't make sense or whatever. And like, it isn't about like just protecting my ego. Believe me, she doesn't protect my (laughs) ego. (laughs) But I appreciate that because it's it's very easy to get in a bubble where people are like, yeah, this is this great. You know, it's great. It's great. It's great. And you're like, you know, you want critics, you want challenges and from somebody that you trust uh, creatively. Here's what I find also so fascinating about you, David. You, Where did you have the the nerve? <laughs> I was thinking of another word to say I'm working as a stunt coordinator. I feel I can direct a production. A, the training, B, the technical aspects, and I'm going to say a C, you have an insanely good sense of, of actors and the craft of acting. Like you, you were an actor or are an actor. Is that right? I don't represent his acting career. <laughs> but, he de- <laughs> but he definitely understands actors in a way that is like mind blowing. It's mind blowing. I re- but I've just got to say, guys, Kelly's right. So where did this confluence come together and give you that confidence to say, I'm going to direct? And how did you actually make the transition? I, I mean, I think there's probably a lot of things I could say were touchstones in the beginning. And, you know, I went to a really small school in high school. You had to do everything or all these activities after school or no one would get to do anything. Right. So I was in sports, but I was in theater and I was in music and I was in you just had to do everything. It's like 40 kids in the class. Right. And so having that sort of broad exposure to the arts, whether they were physical or musical or theater, I learned to appreciate them and I followed them throughout in, in college and, um, and my love. And again, my love for movies, again, my passion was action because I was an athlete first. I don't know. I just, I, was, I, 
He was also, he was a third grade teacher, which I think has a lot to do with how he understands actors. <laughs> my degree, my degree is in education. I have a master. So you really were a third grade teacher? <laughs> yeah, I had, uh, well, I went to the University of Minnesota. I have a degree in international relations and a master's in education. And Kelly, seriously, where, where did I you know, find I know, much this to his parents' dismay, he actually stopped teaching. Because my parents were both. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, right. Now I think the story is different, right? Oh, they still are like, what are you going to like... get a regular job? <laughs> <laughs> you can always go back Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. So <laughs> my isn't that so the greatest? Cute. That is so great. That is so great. Parents, you know, I love what Shirley McLean says. Just when you think you've healed your life, you go home for that. <laughs> that is exactly it. That's exactly it. That's exactly. They know how to push those buttons, you know. So uh, so you were a teacher and then you had a studio. Uh, we again share. We share some. I started my first business when I was 17 years old, a, a dance and acting No school. way. In New Jersey at 17, and I it was I had 100 students and four teachers. So I – and you started yours at like 18 or 19, yeah. right? Yeah, That's I had amazing. a martial arts school. And, um, and then I, you know, I taught kids martial arts, adult martial arts, and um, that was always my passion, athletics and martial arts. So I guess teaching a lot also, you have to understand how people think, how they learn. Kelly got it right. It's like understand, if you can understand a third grader – you can understand it. Actually. Well, it, well, the the simplicity and yet the complex. They're trying to figure out the world and understanding the character. I always think, you know, I went to one of the best acting conservatories in the country. That was my background. What it did is it opened up the notion of how to get to the truth, how to peel back the layers of the onion to get to the essence. And that's what I do today. I what I do is I. I try to distill and synthesize and get to the heart of the matter. And I it, in er, earnestly try to do that with every one of my clients. And I've tried to do it on all of your films. Successfully. Well, think, yeah. Very I successfully. Think, yes, for sure. Well, thank you, guys. And we'll be back in just a moment. I want to talk about uh, Deadpool and, uh, and, and uh, why I didn't work <laughs> on Hobbs and Shaw. And then also, <laughs> also then uh, Bullet Train. We'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Get a glimpse into a secret part of Hollywood that few are aware of and that filmmakers rarely talk about. In the new book, Audienceology by Kevin Getz. Each chapter is filled with never before revealed inside stories and interviews from famous studio chiefs, directors, producers, and movie stars, bringing the art and science of Audienceology into focus. Audienceology, how moviegoers shape the films we love. From Tiller Press at Simon & Schuster. Available now. Oh, gosh. So we're back. Uh, Seriously, let's talk about Deadpool 2. You know, Deadpool 1 was such, to me, a, like, a revelation. I, I It was such an interesting movie. And you always wonder how can the second one be as good as the first. And the fact that it was not only as good, but possibly even surpassed it, it was just... You, you captured the tonality and that irreverence so brilliantly. How did you get to that picture? How did you both uh, get on that picture, number one? And number two, how did you find that brilliant tone? David, he, David actually a little bit got snookered into it because he didn't really want to do a sequel. He was talking to Ryan originally about doing an uh, X-Force, X-Force movie. X-Force. Um, and... Uh, there was still like, I mean, Tim was actually still on Deadpool too. Mm-hmm. And then it sort of worked out where Ryan and David were really hitting it off. And Tim was sort of moving away from Deadpool two. And Ryan was like, how about you just do Deadpool two with me? And Ryan being the charismatic, amazing <laughs> human being that he is, <laughs> David decided to go for it. Yeah. And, I'm going to say no to Ryan. I when, mean, it's know, impossible yeah. to say no to Ryan. And and how did you go about trying to match that same, as I said, tonality so beautifully? Well, I, I'm a fan of Ryan's comedy and, you know, his specific brand of that sort of uh, self-referential stuff that he was doing in Deadpool. So I was already a huge fan of that stuff. And I'm like, that the script had that 
in spades, you know, Wernick and Reese. The script was good, huh? The script was good. And Wernick, uh, Wernick and Reese had wrote it. And um, there had been a lot of drafts that they were trying to get to something. And then he brought Paul and Rhett back in. And I was like, this is really fun. And so the thing we really struggled with was like, how do we get to the heart of it? And what's the moral to the story? Because I think ultimately, you know, um, Deadpool only works as there is a heart real heart in the middle of it because it's so irreverent you can get detached right and collectively um we came up with that idea of like um someone getting a second chance you know sort of that that kid if someone would just show him one act of kindness he may not turn out to be this sort of hitler character in the future and um that got woven into the script and that's where we you know we landed emotionally and then also the love story was there where he goes back and and reconnects with uh, Marina's character. Yeah, And it's funny, I didn't think that there were very many changes that we made from the screening process in that. I think, I think audiences really fell yeah. in love with it. in like, I guessing like 92, 93. And I'm like, okay, we're done. And then Emma's like, I don't believe this. This can't be possible. We got to test again. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I know we went, remember we were in the, we were in the Fox little theater. Yeah. 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 Right. That little theater on the Fox lot. Yes. And we tested it like four times. Yeah. There was <laughs> the last one was outside of Austin and we yeah, baked we, off an opening. We, yeah. You're right. Off. Right. Can you explain to our listeners what baked, baked off, off an opening means? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like Betty Crocker, but uh, it's not. <laughs> Um, it's I guess it's when you have a difference of opinion about it, certain things in this uh, movie. Uh, or you just want to try a couple of different things, which was the case on this one. And it was like, and and you have them run side by side within 15 minutes of each other usually. And it's two separate audiences, but usually the same theater. And then you kind of just test as usual and see where the numbers lie, because yeah. again, that's where really where the truth is. From my point of view, we have to balance the audiences almost identically, demographically, because we're trying to really give the absolute most even keeled response and fair response, right, to uh, to you guys. So you go to the left, you go to the right, you go to the left, you go to the right, theater number one, theater number two, theater number one, theater number two, so that we try to get exactly the same number of, say, males and females, the same number of people under the age of so forth, even um, uh, ethnically, racially, like we're trying to really c- get the balance correct to audience to audience so it's apples to apples as much as mm-hmm. possible. It's really important, I think. Was there ever a time when you guys w- kind of um, wish you did something later and wish you listened to an audience but didn't? Have you ever had an experience like that? How about the opposite, where you wish you'd followed your own instinct and hadn't listened to the audience? Anything like that? It was a picture where the audience was confused in the test. I had this idea that we put voiceover throughout. I think that 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 was one lesson that I wish we would have taken from a testing that, you know, would have really helped the film. Yeah, that's great. It, it's like the wisdom of the crowds, like the audience never, never lies. I like to tell people, it's what David said earlier, you know, I always say when people, uh, if somebody hunks at you, I've said this before to, on this podcast, if, if, pe- if somebody hunks at you on the freeway, you know, they're an asshole. But if um, three people, four people hunk at you, you're the asshole. And, uh, <laughs> and it's like, you got to listen. You know, you can't be tone deaf to this stuff. And it's important. It doesn't mean you necessarily even have to act on it. But it's a it's a worthy conversation to have, certainly. I mean, I can tell you very clearly what I think is your is your greatest movie, Bullet Train, is a terrific movie. It's so good on so many levels. I think you uh, and I think you and Brad Pitt have a um, uh, karma a bashert together too, David. You were his stunt double, yeah, early on. Mm-hmm. Then did, you got uh, to watch him play a stunt man. In Once Upon a Time, what did you think? Did he call you for advice? He didn't, and uh, I'm kind of glad he did it. <laughs> I was going to say, he didn't, <laughs> and, and look what happened to his performance. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, thank God, because then I wouldn't have been responsible for that Academy Award. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a different type of era, and I probably would have just stor- steered him the wrong way. Like, I think he landed it for where it needed to be. Now, that's some was- Midwestern humble pie right there. <laughs> I mean, that, that's like, I mean, that's a really nice thing to say. And then, of course, um, 
you know, you uh, you work together on this picture, and he is so good in it. So good. I, I, I got the feeling like it was a shit ton of fun. It was. We, it was so fun. And to make it during the pandemic, it was actually even more special because we were one of those few movies that got started in the middle of the height of the pandemic and Sony let us make it, you know, and we were, we were trying to figure out the protocols. We were sort of one of the first movies trying to figure out the the rules and how to keep people safe. And um, so, but it was great. It it got our film family back. We call our film family, our DP, our production designer, our AD, like they do all the movies together with us. Costume designer. Like we got our film family working during that time when no one was working. And it yes. looks just beautiful. The movie has a style and look to it. But again, you surprised me, my friend, both of you guys, your, the, your sense of comedy and like a reverence that you probably learned a lot, maybe from working with, with Ryan or on uh, Deadpool 2. But a lot of that was brought into this movie. And uh, it's just a romp and it's a complicated story. So I'm thinking of remnants of how you talked about Atomic Blonde and how you had to weave the threads together because this story is really complicated and intertwined. So it's funny how we we take what we learn from all these different experiences to get us to where we are. You agree with that? Totally. Absolutely. Totally. I think every film is another learning lesson. And um, you know, every testing is another learning lesson for those films. And like, yeah, I mean, I think it's bullet train is, is, is aggregate of um, there's a little bit of Wick. There's a little bit of Atomic Blonde. There's a little bit of Deadpool. There's a little bit of Hobbs and Shaw. <laughs> there's a little bit of everything we've done in that movie, although it is its own completely original bonkers. How did, how did, uh, tell me about Hobbs and Shaw. How did you land that picture? How did you get it? And well, how was the experience? It was great, actually, in a lot of ways. I mean, I think we had our challenges. I mean, there's a lot. It's a you again. We walked into Deadpool. It was an established franchise. We were given a lot of a ton of creative freedom. Um, Universal on Hobbs and Shaw gave us a lot of creative freedom, but there was uh, you had the institutions of Dwayne and Jason, and you know, there's people with their brands and and, and they're the protecting fast. and the fast franchise. Like you can only go so far. I mean, you can defy physics because it's fast and nobody cares, but you can only go so far creatively because there is a lore and there's a fan base. But I, we had fun working within those constraints for sure. It's so much easier when it's just us and we're producing, directing together. And I think there were a lot of other voices in that movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, the hardest part was that we jumped into it while we were releasing right before we released Deadpool 2. We already had a release date before we started shooting. We barely had a script. We didn't, so, we didn't when we started shooting, it, we had an outline. <laughs> so it was like, it, that was the real challenge of it. I think, you know, it's just kind of the expectations, you know, wanting it to be great, like having the opportunity to convert and, you know, pivot from this giant franchise and the weight of that, but pivot into a little bit something different. And we ended up choosing to do it because David always wanted to do a buddy comedy. Um, I was just going to ask you, without a script, how did you make the decision to uh, say yes to that? Well, and then, you know, the the chemistry between Jason and uh, Dwayne in the, you know, franchise was just un, like, it was, it was undeniable. Just, you know, undeniable it was our favorite part of that just so amazing you know and our favorite part of the yeah favorite part of fast probably um you know before uh and um up into like six or seven or whatever it was but like so and and you know if they could just bring that energy david could do one of those old school like 80s buddy action but with like you know, the spectacle and the wow of like a you know what of of what ip or a franchise would allow you to do And there were some major, major stunts in that movie. I mean, you know, Rennie Harlan in my book, Audienceology, talks about a big change he made in Cliffhanger when um, he they crafted this amazing stunt called, I think, The King's Leap. You know the story? I don't know. Okay, so they orchestrated this big thing with Stallone leaping across the and, and, and it was it was done like real, like it was practical. And the audience said, no way, no one could ever do that. So Rennie ended up cutting it and doing a different sort of thing uh, to get him to the other side, if you will. Wow. And so I'm wondering, was there ever a spectacular, I don't know, stunt 
that you thought was going to work a certain way and it just didn't work that way? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have an anecdote that I don't have an anecdote that pops to mind. I'll say that in fast because you said there were so many different spectacle set pieces. We were combining CG and practical effects in a really unique way because you have to get the scale of things that don't really exist in reality. Um, there, were a lot, there was a lot of experimentation, like, you know, this would never, you know, you could do something that was way more, uh, we would jump a car, for example, like we jumped the Simon Crane directed a little bit of second unit and he actually jumped this car and landed on the back of a semi. And again, that in itself is a feat of special effects, stunt driving, rigging like and yet you see it and everyone's like eh, this is fast so what do we do we cg take over the car we make it we add this smoke we you know put the we change the distance and you're like it's sad because there are times now especially in that franchise where you're like we got to hang three trucks off a helicopter before people even think it's a stunt and the actual big stunts don't maybe look as big in that world Kelly, how, as a producer, do you do you approach, a, I was going to say a movie like that, I would say a day when you, you know, I mean, the preparation has got to be extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is. I think we, we are so lucky to have, I mean, first, what's amazing, one of the amazing things about David as a director is how much he understands production and every department, because as a, coming up as a stunt you know, kind of person and coordinator and second unit director, you have to work with all the departments and really specifically and to, you know, together and sort of be in the trenches together in those ways. And so you have to like understand what gives and what takes, you know, are required departmentally, basically. And so it's a gift for a producer to be able to be in a, you know, sort of situation like that where the director is, you're not having to explain to the director, well, here's how this and this has to happen in order to get your vision. It's like he actually is in there solving the problems with you and figuring it out together with the team. And I think it's one of the reasons his, you know, he's an incredible leader and his department heads are devotees in a sense that like, you know, every best idea wins in his mind and it's all they're all together solving all the problems. And, and, and honestly, um, he loves prep. And so as much preparation as you can do, the safer those days are, the better those days are, the more successful they are. And, and, you know, and that's kind of where we come from, um, which I'm, is probably the mantra for everybody, but in, in, you know, there, there is something special about every, you know, some of the things being giant and spectacle and just bigger, you know? Yeah. It's um, David, do you get nervous when you yeah. embark? I do. On, I oh mean, my gosh. What was your most nerve wracking experience as a director entering what, entering which picture? Deadpool. No, I mean, sorry, bullet train. Is it? Yeah. Oh, I think, yeah, this last He's one. He's kind of like a golden retriever. He forgets the bad <laughs> stuff sometimes. I love watching the two of you are, you know, <laughs> just a fabulous retriever. couple just going, no, this is what you remembered. No, you don't, you don't like onions. You, you, you don't eat them. Well, no, we had, we've had this. Uh, they give you gas, we remember? We yeah. had this discussion slash argument. No, I would say I do, at the beginning of every movie, have anxiety and like, I don't believe in this script, or if you have a script. <laughs> um, I don't know what this material is. What is the theme of the movie? What is the theme of the movie? You might know this, Kevin. Like when we tested Bullet Train, and I'm not going to give anything away, but like there were multiple beginnings. And part of it was like I was trying to really guide the audience to the theme of the movie. And like, and I wanted to make sure it landed with a sledgehammer and maybe the movie didn't need it. And it was some of the things that testing. The brought out it's like, like they didn't need it but <laughs> too much past, of a sledgehammer <laughs> but in the past in the past I've always felt like some of the work that I do it's fun and it's commercial and but people don't understand why they like it so much because there's a theme in the middle of it where there's a there's some emotion to it that they're not connecting because the spectacle so the cotton candy's there but they don't realize that so is the broccoli and but that's why I think those movies have longevity. I think that's the mix. That's right? a very good point, David. And, you know, and I love the fact that you guys are not freaked out when you hear audience response. It didn't hurt that, let's just say, uh, Bullet Train tested extraordinarily well from the beginning. That always is <laughs> yeah. a nice thing. You can listen. You may be able to listen a little bit more. You know. Uh, no, you know, look, when I come out and have to deliver uh, the, the, the news that, you know, your child is not 
what you thought it was. In this case, <laughs> it's always nice to come out, look, your child just has a minor little thing. And <laughs> here's what I would suggest you do. The audience is saying this or this. And so, and for you to hear that, uh, you're such good parents. <laughs> well, thank you. Best for the movie. What's best for the movie? Yeah, you? exactly. Yeah, well, I mean, and and we've been lucky that way. You know, I mean, more than not, have we had the opportunity? I mean, ha- ha- had that response of you know, sort of like they're they they want to love this, and here's a few things that they want to love this exactly. Yeah, they want. Yeah, they're they're with it. I mean, you could feel it in the room, right? They're with it, but yeah. how could you get them? Even what they don't know, they don't know what they don't know. But right. they are telling you, reacting to what they're seeing, what they're feeling yeah. at the moment. And it's up to you guys to give them that if you if you are lucky enough to figure it out, which which you seem to always do. What's next for this team? Um, uh, we're actually in production on a little movie uh, up in Winnipeg, kind of nobody style. It's uh, with David Harbour starring as Santa Claus. Um and uh, kicking ass. And it's kicking really, ass. really fun. Action Santa. Um, Who's, who are you then, doing that for? Who's that? That's with Universal again. Uh huh. Our home, our home studio, who we love very much. Although I wanted, I did want to tip off one of the things about Bullet Train that makes it so special is the fact that Sony and Tom um, wanted and supported an original in a way that like is so rare these days. And, and Sanf- uh, Sanford has always talked to me. Uh, Sanford too, uh, for sure. Absolutely, Sam- absolutely. right. And, mm-hmm. and we feel so lucky to have had that support and protection, um, especially making it during COVID, especially, you know, with which comes with a million question marks and concerns and fears and stuff. And then, you know, just kind of being so into it and along for the ride, even though it is, in my opinion, a, a, a unconventional sort of, you know, arc for a protagonist and really unique. But you know. so theatrical nonetheless. Incredibly theatrical. You know what I and mean? They they, and, 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 and Tom and Sanford really understand that. Uh, maybe two of the most astute today understand. And, you know, you got to give it to Sony. I mean, what a year they had uh, understanding yeah. what still is what we'll call theatrically worthy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Totally. And that's really something else. I, I, I got to say. Yeah. We, lo- we love that. I but... think the feeling is 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 a completely mutual and obviously Universal and you guys have an extraordinary, uh, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, we feel so blessed by their support. And um, and, and da- we're anticipating that David's next film will be there and we'll be shooting it this summer, fall. So yeah. if I'll go. Well, Can you give us a t- tease action, uh, action comedy? Yeah, it's, action, less it's, comedy. But a lot a of lot action. Of, I'm just going to throw something out there. And uh, if your agent is listening or at your reps or whoever you work with. I would say that I want to see something that is human based and actor based in your in your repertoire uh, in the not too distant future, because I know you'll knock it out of the park. Both of you will. You both are very sensitive and wonderful filmmakers. And uh, I know that what I love about your your what you're saying and what you continue to bring out into the world is that there's heart at all of your in all of your work. And so I know that there's a lot more to come from both of you. And I am so excited to see it and hopefully to help guide you through with audience feedback to to realize your dreams. And thank you both so much for doing this podcast. I, I love you both. Thank you. Aww, we love you we, too, we Kevin. You. Thanks for inviting us. And we look forward to those, uh, those next screenings and then, um, you know, that's, I'm going to quote you on that because a director usually doesn't say those words. I look forward to seeing you at those screenings. Oh, a, I will look forward to the testing because then you go, now I can start. Now, I'm not, now it's just not my own bullshit. I need to <laughs> so, Have a great one, you guys. Thanks so much. To our listeners, I encourage you to check out Bullet Train if you haven't already and also to follow them on social media. I hope you enjoy the interview today. For other stories like this one, please check out my book, Audienceology, at Amazon or wherever books are sold, or through my website at kevingets360.com. Also, please follow me on social media at kevingets360. Next time on Don't Kill the Messenger, we will welcome Roxanne and Dion Taylor, another really impressive producing and directing team. You won't want to miss this one. Until then, I'm Kevin Getz, and to you, our listeners, 
I appreciate you being part of the movie-making process. Your opinions matter. See you soon.